Good evening, everybody. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Mark Williamson, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this very special uh, conversation with uh, Martin Seligman and uh, hosted by Richard Layard. Um, I'm going to very briefly uh, just let you know what the plan is for this evening and then hand over to these two uh, wonderful, inspiring thought leaders in the world of happiness, well-being and positive psychology for what I'm sure will be a wonderful discussion. For anyone who isn't aware, Action for Happiness is a big global community of people trying to take action for a happier world. It's about a personal conviction that we can each make a difference, not only to our own well-being, but to the well-being of those that we can influence in our homes, schools, workplaces and communities. And thank you to the many thousands of people who are already on this webinar this evening, to the many more who are watching via live stream, and to everybody who's <laughs> part of this global movement to try and create a happier world. This evening we have an absolute treat in store for you. We have, first of all, the co-founder of Action for Happiness, a great friend of mine, Richard Layard, who, who has created and done so much to promote the cause for happiness. And he will be taking us through a conversation with the founder of Positive Psychology, the one and only Martin Seligman, who has, again, been an absolute pioneer in this field. And we're all so excited to hear Marty's latest views on the world of positive psychology, especially right now with all the challenges we face in this world. So these two will have a wonderful conversation, which I'll leave them to in a moment. But just to <coughs> let you all know as the audience, you have the opportunity to post questions as a Q&A feature in the, uh, in the webinar. So do please feel free to, to ask questions. And at about... Um, 35, 40 minutes into the conversation, I'll be coming back to, to pose some of those questions to our special guests. Unfortunately, we won't have time for all of them, but we're very much looking forward to hear from you. And of course, already seeing thousands <laughs> of you joining in the chat as well. So a very warm welcome. And I will now hand over to Richard Laird to take us through this evening's conversation. Thank you all. Well, hello, everybody. Um, and my hello to Marty. It's really wonderful to have you here uh, or somewhere with us. Marty. Um, I think it's nearly 20 years since I first uh, sat at your feet uh, and I've been sitting there ever since. Um, I have personally learned so much from you. Uh, the world well-being movement has uh, learned so much from you and of course Action for Happiness has enormously helped by you. So uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, We've never had a situation quite like the present one. Um, I mean, everybody's life uh, is different. Uh, the strains are different and so on. Um, I think almost everybody uh, has been driven to think a little more about uh, their mental life and what's going on inside their heads. And uh, some people are really struggling. We know there's a big increase um, in mental illness, uh, in Britain at least. And I wondered what you would say to all of us really, how can we better manage our mental life, in particular in, in challenging situations? How, how can we actually maintain our good spirits? Well, first, Richard, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, talking about well-being at a good times is a routine, uh, but the question about happiness, optimism, well-being, at a time of real human challenge uh, matters. And I'm glad we're having this conversation. Uh, by the way, I've sat at your feet at least as much as you have at mine. And uh, I hope some of the Nobel Committee is watching because there is one in economics and I've been waiting for you to uh, uh, get the Nobel, which you very much deserve. Um, Having said that, Richard, let, let's begin a conversation about well-being under the challenge of COVID. So I'm going to say something fairly counterintuitive ab about happiness and well-being at this time. So I want to distinguish different aspects of what is positive. So on the one hand, there's the smiley face, uh, being merry, cheerful, feeling good, high subjective well-being, which as Richard knows, is something that I've uh, had reservations about. Uh, Richard's theories are very much uh, wrapped up in subjective well-being. Uh, might have been more wrapped up in 
cognitive states like optimism as opposed to feeling states like being cheerful. Well, Richard, I'm about to come over onto your side and endorse the smiley face. But let me tell you why. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, the distinction here is feeling good, an emotional state, and being optimistic about the future and hopeful, which is a cognitive state, which is not necessarily rep uh, correlated very highly with being good. Now there's interesting data about infectious illness and these two different states. So let me tell you a, a summary of the data. It's uh, Sheldon Cohen from uh, Carnegie Mellon who's produced this. Basically, uh, about 15 years ago, Sheldon took a large number of volunteers, uh, isolated them, and injected rhinovirus into their nose. Rhinovirus is, I believe, a coronavirus, by the way. Uh, and he injected a 50% dose, so that roughly half the people would come down with a cold and the other half would not. And then he isolated them and asked how bad were the colds, who got them, and could he predict infectious illness? And the results were very surprising. So in advance, he had measured two salient aspects of positive psychology. One was the smiley face, people who were positively effective, cheerful, high well-being people, people like Richard Laird, in fact. Uh, and the other were people more like me, uh, low positive effectives, but highly optimistic and hopeful people. So the challenging question was, who would get colds and how severe would they be? And the answer surprised me. Optimism had no effect on infectious illness. What mattered was cheer, merriness, having fun. It was the smiley face people who uh, had less severe colds that lasted for a shorter time. Um, and he replicated this with several different viruses, if I'm not mistaken. But the lesson here, lesson one, is during this difficult time, during a pandemic, if your goal is to ward off infectious illness, what should you be doing? And the answer is having fun. Having as much fun in this difficult circumstance as you possibly can. Uh, reading literature, we bought a puppy. Uh, we've been <laughs> isolating with four dogs, uh, uh, four children, their spouses and the like, and trying to have as much fun as we possibly could. That, by the way, is not easy for me being a low positive effective, but the puppy making love as much as possible, drinking wine that you like, dancing, listening to your favorite music. I listen to Meatloaf a lot and I listen to the Berlin Symphony a lot. So part one of what I wanted to say, Richard, the best guess we can make about what positive psychology says about during a pandemic is good cheer, and making merry as best you can. Well, well that's, uh, that's very encouraging. Yeah, sorry, did you want to say your part two? Part two, optimism and hope. When does that matter? Well, that matters as we come out of the pandemic. Optimism and hope had no effect on warding off infectious illness, being highly, uh, 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 effectively uh, positive did. But the basic literature on optimism and hope is people who are optimistic, who in general believe that bad events are temporary, that bad events are local, not pervasive, and that you can do something about bad events. These are the people who act, who bring us innovation, who bring us out of crisis. So when I think about the future and coming out of the pandemic, and, and this too shall pass, uh, what the kind of leadership we need, the kind of workers we need, the kind of uh, mental health people we need, 
will be people who radiate and inspire hope. So during the pandemic, have fun. As you come out of the pandemic, fun is secondary. And what matters is optimism about the future and trying to do something about the future. Well, that, that sounds wonderful advice. But of, of course, there's the issue of how um, some people who are not naturally uh, that way um, can achieve the ability to have fun or to be optimistic. Uh, and uh, I know you've thought a lot about childhood uh, and what can we do, uh, particularly in schools, uh, to uh, produce the kind of people who will, in a crisis, have fun and out of a crisis be optimistic. So, so t tell us a bit about, if you would, about the secret of producing uh, positivity through education. Well, the first thing not to do is be, don't be delusional. That is, unrealistic optimism uh, does nothing. The question is realistic optimism. Now, how does one find hope in a dif difficult situation like this? Well, we first have to recognize that there are two victimology industries, two industries who make their living uh, making things appearing worse than they actually are. One is journalism, the news you're getting all the time, and the second is politics. Now, in both those cases, I think we really need a slant toward realistic optimism. So when the pandemic began, uh, I glued myself to the news and opening up the London Times, the New York Times, what I got was daily the bleakest news possible. Uh, and in politics, the same. The more, if you're not the incumbent, the more unhappy, the more troubled people are, the more they will vote against the incumbent. So you want realistic optimism. You want to look at the news. Bertrand Russell said the mark of a civilized human being was the ability to read a column of statistics and weep. And the other side of that is the ability to read a column of statistics and see that life is hopeful. So you can look at the absolute level of death, the absolute level of, of uh, the pandemic, but there are all sorts of statistics that tell us that this is passing now, not gone. But what you want to do is not concentrate on the politics and the journalism of disaster. You want the politics and journalism of hope. And you want that to be based in the statistics uh, in reality, Richard. No, I agree with that. Um, but I'm thinking that a lot of the people listening to us are parents or teachers. Uh, and they would like their children to grow up as realistic optimists. Uh, and you've written a lot about that. But uh, tell us what you think is feasible. Let's, what, <laughs> let's put it this way. What is realistic uh, that parents and teachers can do to generate resilience uh, and realistic optimism in the children uh, that, uh, that they care for? Well, I think this is a great time to look at that. So uh, in the way that for your life, World War II was formative. Uh, for me, uh, the area of the 60s was formative. This is going to be the formative time of life for our very young people. So as we come out of this pandemic, it is important for uh, parents to show children what's going on, to talk about progress, and to talk about hope. And indeed, there are a set of, in addition to the reality of coming out of a pandemic and looking at the reality, uh, uh, there are a set of exercises to do. Um, in, in many ways, the, the most important one is uh, uh, what, what we call putting it in perspective. So let me, let me tell you how, what that's about. The, the human mind, 
for very good evolutionary reasons. We are creatures of the ice age. The, the mentality that evolved was the mentality of catastrophization. If you, if our, our uh, ancestors in the ice age, those ancestors who said, oh, it's a lovely day in London today. I'll bet tomorrow will be lovely as well, got crushed by the ice. The ancestors that survived and the ones who gave us our brains were the ones who said, it, it's a lovely day today, but that's an illusion. The, the ice is coming, famine is coming and the like. So very importantly, we have brains that are biased toward the most catastrophic. Now the problem about a catastrophic brain is it works well in an ice age. It works well in a pandemic that never ends, but it doesn't work well in a world that is flourishing, in a world that is getting better. So let me tell you about the exercise here. Uh, first, a bad event occurs, and I'll take myself in the pandemic when it was first obvious to me that I was a 77-year-old man in good health, but a 77 necessarily. I was at high risk. And the first thing I thought was the most catastrophic thing. Uh, I'm going to get this virus and I'm going to suffer and die. And so the first thing you want to do in putting it in perspective is to conjure up your very worst thoughts. Then what you want to do is, okay, that's the worst, most catastrophic out outcome. What's the best possible outcome? Well, best possible outcome is I may have already had this thing and not know it. Uh, I'm not going to get anything at, at all. I'll be just fine. Okay. Having done the best and the worst, the question is, what's the most realistic outcome? And the most realistic outcome is in between. Well, sometime in the next year and a half, I will probably get it. Uh, I'm going to stay in shape. I'm going to work on good cheer and optimism. And uh, this may well be a mild to moderate case. So, one thing important to do with children is what's the most catastrophic thing that can occur? What's the best thing that can occur? And what's the most realistic thing that can occur? That's one of several exercises, Richard, that you and I have both written about. So, so Marty, one of the, the obvious things about this present crisis um, is that what we each of us do um, is going to have a huge effect on other people as well as ourselves. And of course, there are a lot of people who really are not at much personal risk, uh, but they can bring death to other people. So that the, uh, the, the issue of the common good ha has raised itself in perhaps the most conspicuous way um, in anybody's lifetime since the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, we've seen people have responded with a, a degree of fellow feeling and, uh, uh, and care for each other um, that has surprised some of the more cynical um, people that I know. Uh, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, obviously, if we're talking about what kind of people do we want to be, <laughs> in the end, the end, the fundamental question is what sort of a person do I want to be? Perhaps that's the most important question in life. Um, we want people, um, I think, to be creators of happiness. So we have this uh, pledge in Action for Happiness, I will try and create as much happiness in the world as I can, and as little unhappiness. Um, some people have, have questioned whether positive psychology has as much uh, of that altruistic side to it um, as perhaps it should have, or whether it did originally, whether it's changed a bit. Um, tell, could you tell us where in the, in the positive psychology field which you, you, uh, you, you lead, um, where, where, where is altruism as opposed to the wonderful wisdom that you, you teach about self-care? Um, well, let me go back 70, more than 75 years, almost 80 years now, to the London Blitz to talk about altruism and the importance 
of solidarity and fellow feeling in a time like this. Um, now, as Richard knows, he was a boy at the time, when the Blitz began, uh, the psychiatric uh, world predicted 3 million psychiatric casualties in England. And London was ringed with emergency centers for psychiatric casualties as the Blitz began. Three months later, they closed up because there were no psychiatric casualties. Now, why was that? And I think it had to do with fellow feeling, altruism, patriotism, and solidarity that occurred among Brits. And these are things that militate against despair, against giving up, against depression, against panic and anxiety. Now, the message for today is the same. What really matters, what, what, what kind of solidarity we're not going down in shelters together, unfortunately. And the fact that we're isolating alone uh, militates against it. But positive psychology tells us that altruism is one of the best routes to meaningful, positive uh, life satisfaction. And in fact, uh, uh, people often ask me, because I work on depression, if I'm depressed right now, what's the one thing that I can do that that's most likely to work? And the answer is to turn off Zoom, find someone who needs help and go out and help them. We are wired to have life satisfaction, to have happiness and well-being when we help others. So what's been missing for me in the UK, in the United States, in many ways, in many places of the world uh, is the fellow feeling and altruism uh, that happened during the Blitz. So Richard, something like action for happiness is exactly right. Solidarity, and it's not solidarity about producing your own happiness, but very often solidarity about going out, finding kind things to do that can help other people. This is right at the heart of positive psychology and particularly during a pandemic. Marty, we're, we're all part of, uh, I suppose, what you could call the world happiness movement. Um, people who are trying to uh, assert that what ultimately matters is how people feel inside themselves uh, and trying to uh, find ways in which we can uh, make people have a better quality of life as they experience it. And that, that includes people coming from psychological side, from the social side, from even the political side. Um, but um, I think this is still a minority movement. Um, we, uh, it's, lo it's lovely speaking to ourselves, but we want to speak to more people. So, so I, I would li like to ask you, I mean, you must have reflected on this. How yeah. are we to get through to the majority? Because uh, we, we have great organizations. You have the um, International Psy um, Positive Psychology Association that's doing massive amount of good all around the world with followers everywhere. Uh, we have Action for Happiness and there are many others uh, that are trying the same, uh, to, to spread the same message. But we haven't got through to the majority. The majority culture is still a very macho culture of personal success. Um, people are telling their children their main objective has got to be to do better than other people, a zero-sum game. Whereas we want people, as you say, to be more solidar solidaristic, terrible word. Um, we want people to be getting their satisfaction from creating happiness for other people. That, that's, that, that's a very important thing. Of course, we want people to enjoy playing the piano and, <laughs> on their own and all sorts of other things. Um, but we want an important part of our happiness to be coming from creating happiness for other people. And that is not central to the message which is going out to our young people. At, at the moment, um, it's certainly not 
um, the effect that social media are having, where, which are encouraging a form of showing off, um, which leads uh, everybody uh, to feel more left out than they did before, as, as the uh, wonderful work of Jean Twang has shown. So how are we going to get through to the majority and change, change this rather uncivilized culture that, that, uh, it, that we, 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 we're struggling with? Important question, and it's a particularly acute question for this audience. So as I see the questions going uh, back and forth, I can see that quite a few of you are coaches. Uh, and here's what I want to say uh, about altruism, about coaching at this time. It's be a PERMA person. And let me explain what that means. Um, in the, there are some people who make your day, who are sunspots, who are bearers of energy and good cheer and bearers of optimism. And that's a hard thing to do during a pandemic. But what we know about coaching, what we know about getting through the pandemic and recovering is that we want perma persons. So if you look at uh, recovery from wounds, for example, there's a literature on wound healing in which people make a little cut on your finger and you can quantify how quickly uh, you heal, uh, how quickly the scab forms. Uh, the answer is, interestingly, that uh, people whose well-being is higher uh, heal faster and take less medication after surgery. Now, that tells us that what we want to impart to other people, what we want to lead, is well-being. So when I think, Richard, about action for happiness, I'm thinking what we can do for others. And the answer is to be a PERMA person as hard as it is at a time like this, because that will bring better health, more optimism, and more resilience among the people you love and care for. Marty, when we were chatting before, uh, you mentioned um, your latest thinking um, about what the sources of progress and uh, I hadn't heard about this, and I'm sure everybody else would love to hear what your latest thinking is about how to achieve human progress. Well, I, I've, I've taken on uh, a project that exceeds my grasp by a lot. And it's the question of um, agency over human history and the importance of individual and collective beliefs that they can change the world, that we can change the world. And the hypothesis that I'm acting under, Richard, is that at times in the long history and uh, across time, across cultures, across religions, the times at which people believe that they matter, that they can do something, that they have efficacy, that this efficacy will last, they're future-minded. These are times when human progress occurs. Conversely, when people have ideologies and beliefs that say, oh, it's all God's grace, it's all the government, I can't do anything, these are times of great stagnation. So what I'm trying to do from hunter-gatherers on uh, is to ask the question, what can we infer about the level of agency the level of efficacy that people had at that time in those cultures, and how does that relate to the existence or non-existence of progress? And, and just to give one example, uh, from Augustine in the fourth century till about 1450, uh, the belief in Christianity, Catholicism, about agency was that it was all God's grace that you could not do anything to get into heaven or to avoid hell. Uh, if you did, it was God's grace. That was a time of enormous stagnation, in spite of the apologists for the Middle Ages. Uh, almost nothing happened uh, other than the invention of hay and the heavy plow, as best I can see. 
But starting around 1450, uh, Catholicism began to change and people like Pico and then Erasmus challenged the belief that there's nothing human beings can do. And a humanistic Catholicism arose, which said we could participate in our own grace. And it was this belief, contrary to the Reformation, by the way, Calvin and Luther were not about uh, human efficacy. They were uh, very strong determinists. But there was in the air in the West from 1450 uh, on, there was a growing notion that human being it was not written, that human beings could do something to make the world better. And it's that psychological state that I believe was the engine of science and art and human progress. So what I'm trying to do is to take that hypothesis, look across time, across culture, and ask uh, the relationship of agency to uh, progress. And the reason that's important, it's about our future. Now, certainly our future depends on altruism. Uh, I'm sorry, on economics. It depends on not having a pandemic as well. And those are things we may not have enormous amount of control over. But we have a great deal of control over the mind, our own mind and the mind of others. This is indeed the discovery of psychology in the 20th century that feelings and thoughts just don't descend on you. You have choice about them. And this thesis says that what we want to educate ourselves and the world if we want human progress and what we have control over is uh, PERMA, optimism, positive emotion, meaning in life, accomplishment. So that's what I'm working on now, Richard. It's the uh, toughest, uh, project I've ever been involved in. My daughter, my oldest daughter, I have seven children. Amanda uh, is a professional historian. I sent her a draft of this. She wrote back and said, uh, you don't know any history. You're not qualified to do this. Um, uh, your problems are insurmountable. And she gave me a reading list uh, in history, which I'm wading my way through and trying to learn something about it. And uh, uh, that's where I am in writing. But the, the thesis is that human agency, the belief that you can change the important events in your life, both individually and collectively, is the immediate driver of human progress. You mentioned the, the Reformation, which was very interesting to me, because... Um, I suppose the most important idea in the Reformation um, was that there's a good part in, uh, uh, in everybody. Um, and that really the way to the answer to the question of what sort of person do I want to be is I want to be like the best part of myself. Uh, and I want to be true to the best part of myself. Um, what, what what do you, how do you think, do you think that's an important idea? I don't think we've ever discussed it, but uh, it's not, it's not, it's not so far off from agency. Agency also means, of course, that, that there's got to be room for you to, to move in when you're trying to realize the best part of yourself. But, yeah. but to be true to the best part of yourself as a source of inner joy and happiness, what do you think about that? Well, that's interesting. I, I, um, in, in my thinking about the Reformation, uh, I, I hadn't thought much about the authenticity thing. Uh, and of course, this is related to uh, whether or not you're among the elect. So in uh, Calvinist and Luther thinking, uh, uh, you can't do anything to become among the elect, but you can look for signs of it, like being wealthy and being true to yourself. But importantly for me, what happens in the Reformation uh, is the Counter-Reformation brought about by Arminius and uh, Dutch Protestantism. It occurs around 1660, in which uh, the Arminian heresy against the, the Puritans, the Calvinists, uh, and the like, basically says you can participate in your own grace. 
you can do things to get into heaven. And most particularly, you can do good works to get into heaven. And so being among the elect is no longer a passive thing that's a gift of God, but it's something that you can achieve. So for me, um, uh, what modern Protestantism becomes, and by the way, I have yet to meet a Calvinist or a Lutheran theologian who still believes what Luther and Calvin did uh, about the absence of free will. Uh, for me, uh, agency becomes the crucial outcome of uh, um, modern Protestantism, uh, from Arminius to Wesley to modern Protestantism. And of course, uh, the Enlightenment atheistic is all about human achievement, about what we can do, about individual purpose in life, and that you yourselves can do something. So for me, uh, much of human progress, as halting as it's been over the, the last uh, 14,000 years, is about the development of the belief in individual and collective agency. Well, I think we're all heirs of the Enlightenment. That's uh, how I think Action for Happiness likes to think of itself. Um, Marty, there are doubtless hundreds of questions that have been coming in. Mark has been fielding them all, <coughs> sifting them, and, and is going to, to uh, uh, feed, feed you with questions. Mark. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and Marty, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for what you've shared already. Um, there were thousands of people on this discussion. And as Richard said, we've been bombarded with questions. Um, I'd like to start by taking us back to the, 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 the individual challenges we're facing in the crisis. There's a few questions here about difficult situations. So I might group a few of these together. Um, an anonymous uh, user has asked, what advice do you have if one is unable to find hope or have fun or find joy in the current situation? We, I think we all understand those things are important, but what happens if that's really hard? Uh, a related person has said, I I'm a merry and hopeful person, but how do I manage children at home being schooled, an irritable husband, I've lost my job uh, and I have a sense of guilt. So there were people dealing with uh, challenges that make joy and so on very difficult right now, what, what can they do to cultivate that? Well, I think these are important questions. And in isolation, finding joy, finding altruism, finding things you can do is much more difficult and challenging. Uh, and uh, uh, part of the role, I think, of positive psychology and action for happiness now is to give hints about what you can do. Uh, now, my hints are small. Uh, I bought a puppy, and we've been raising a puppy for four months. I get up at five in the morning, and I take the puppy out, uh, and the like. Uh, uh, I make love as much as possible as I can. Uh, I, I uh, uh, spend a serious amount of time uh, cooking the foods I like best. So I don't have a formula for people. And I, Im importantly, this is a difficult time to find the things you love doing. But the answer is ask yourself before the pandemic, what did you most like doing? What gives you the most joy? And which of those things can you do now? Not to be forgotten is altruism. That is even isolated you can help other people. And in fact, what Richard and I and Mark are doing right now is taking ourselves out of isolation, not to help ourselves, but to talk with coaches and all of you people about how to be more altruistic and kind uh, during this time. So Mark, I don't have a lot of answers here, but this is incumbent upon Action for Happiness and positive psychology to generate as many ideas as possible. Thank you, Marty. There's a related question from Inga, which says, can you tell us about learned helplessness in relation to the crisis? Uh, and there's a follow on question I'll come to in a moment, but you obviously studied learned helpfulness, uh, learned helplessness 
uh, for a long time. Is, do we, are we seeing a lot of that right now, do you think? Oh, in, indeed, and that's right at the, the heart of what I'm saying. So what we know about the uh, couple of thousand articles on learned helplessness is that when human beings feel helpless, when they're out of control, they're more depressed, they don't do much, and they're much more susceptible to physical illness. Uh, so the pandemic is a helplessness inducer. And that's why the building of PERMA, the building of happiness, finding the things that you can do in isolation that exert control is so important right now. So what we've got is world learned helplessness. And the lesson is we have to fight our way out of it. Uh, and uh, very much the theme of putting it in perspective, being altruistic, finding the things you love doing and doing them, uh, is these are all anti-helplessness techniques. Indeed. Uh, so that's obviously very helpful for us individually. Uh, the next question is from Alan Samuel, who says, how can we help family and friends who voice negative viewpoints, who uh, exhibit learned helplessness without being drawn into the negativity? So obviously our relationships are so important right now. What can we do when we are living with someone who maybe is in that helpless state? Can we, can we change that at all? Um, yes, but you can't do it in a heavy handed way. And, um, so, for example, uh, uh, just last night, uh, Mandy was looking at the statistics in the United States of uh, an alarming increase in the number of positive cases. And uh, I said, well, let's look closely at these statistics. And what we found was that in Florida and Arizona, indeed, these things are going up. Uh, but in Pennsylvania, and particularly where we live, they're going down. So it's important to be realistic and to counter the worst news with as accurate a view of the future as you can marshal. Uh, now, that's part of the putting it in perspective exercise. Remember, we are catastrophizers, uh, pessimistic people like me by nature. People we love are often attracted to the most catastrophic interpretation and one of the important things is when pessimism and catastrophization is unrealistic is to treat it, to treat those voices saying that it's all over, you're going to die, the world is going to hell, it's never going to recover, with um, as if that voice was someone who's coming from someone whose mission in life was to make you miserable, to make you helpless, a, a rival for your job or your spouse, and to argue rationally against it. So, uh, Mark, I think the best weapon we have against despair now is reality. Thank you, Marty. Uh, I think related to that, and maybe you've already covered this, but Beth asked, can you say a bit about the concept of realistic optimism versus outright optimism? So it's, it's sort of, you know, she made the point as you just have about facing reality, but also the power of choice. Do you think that that term realistic optimism is, is, is really important here? Well, uh, realistic optimism is crucial. There's this large literature on visualization and it makes the claim that being a uh, saying, uh, I'm a great person, uh, the, the putt's going to go into the, the whole, uh, it's been argued that merely desiring these things and saying these things to yourself and visualizing success somehow increases success. And the answer is it doesn't. Uh, these things are uh, uh, fake. Uh, in the visualization literature, you, what you have to do if you're a golfer is not just visualize the ball going into the cup. You have to hold the club. You have to visualize the route to success. Um, and so uh, 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 flexible optimism is really important, reality-based optimism. And uh, let me give you a kind of rule of thumb for it. Uh, when is pessimism appropriate? When is optimism appropriate? 
Well, ask yourself, what's the uh, consequence of optimism and pessimism in this situation? So um, let's say you're a pilot and you're thinking about de-icing the airplane. Uh, you say, well, we've de-iced it once. Here, optimism uh, is catastrophic. The cost of being an optimist if you're a pilot and not de-icing the plane is catastrophic. Whereas if uh, going back and forth in the chat, you uh, see a chat that you really like and there's a person you'd really like to get to know and you're thinking about introducing yourself to that person, uh, what's the cost of failure here? Cost of failure is trivial. It's just one more rejection in life's long series of rejections. So if the consequences of failure are not large, use optimism. If the consequences of failure are catastrophic, use pessimism. So during the pandemic, you're thinking about uh, writing a long letter to your fifth grade teacher who gave you uh, great advice about what to do. Well, what are the consequences of sending that letter and her not caring at all? Well, they're trivial. Use optimism, write the letter. Uh, on the other hand, if you're thinking about going to a pub tonight without a, um, uh, a mask on, here the uh, uh, consequences are, can be catastrophic. There you want to use pessimism. A very powerful example, thank you. Um, Marty and Richard, there's a couple of questions for you both, which I think build on this theme. Um, so I'd like to invite both of you to respond to these. Uh, Heth says, what, is the, what are the panelists' views of the new normal? I feel we shouldn't just go back to our old ways. There are huge new opportunities. Uh, and similarly, uh, John Peel has asked, what do Marty and Richard think might be the positive outcomes from the pandemic? Well, Richard, I'm, I'm so curious about hearing you. I've learned so much from you about the state of the real world that why don't you start and I'll, I'll chime in. But, well, I, I think there, there, are, there are at least three sort of silver linings. Um, one is this um, improved sense of solidarity, which we somehow have to, to lock in. But I think people have, have, have been reminded in a way that they, uh, they needed reminding of, in a way, of what it actually is to feel engaged in some big common endeavor um, with, it, with, with, with your fellows. Um, the second has been, of course, this much greater awareness um, of the importance of our mental life, because everybody has had to think about the management of their mental life in a way that they don't when they're rushing around all the time. They, they may get by without doing it. Um, and I think that this is, is a big opportunity for the well-being movement, because that it, the central part of that is the belief that the, the mental, the inner mental life is the, is the ultimate reality for humans. Um, I think it also gives us a huge chance of, of pressing for the improvement of mental health services, which are so scandalous uh, worldwide. Um, and, and the third thing, of course, is that's happened is that um, things have been done which nobody ever thought could be done. I mean, we, we're having a record deficit, budget deficit, that nobody would have ever imagined possible. Uh, and yet it's just uh, become possible. So I'm again hoping that this is the moment when we can get governments to really think through what are their objectives. Um, and one of our uh, dearest wishes, of course, is that governments would make the happiness of the people their objective. Um, as Thomas Jefferson said, it should be the life and happiness of the people. It's the sole legitimate objective of government. Uh, we've somehow or other got to get um, from this COVID crisis a, a serious reconsideration of what, the, what is the purpose of government and what uh, should be its priorities. So I think we, will, we, we, we can get better government and we can get better personal lives, both. Um, well, let me add to that. Um, 
uh, there's that saying that there's nothing like the, the gallows to focus the mind. Mm. Uh, and there's nothing like coming face to face with death to focus the mind. It tells us, it, it pleads with us to think about what's really important uh, in our lives and in the people around us. So I think the uh, entire world has come face to face uh, with death uh, in a stronger way than any time since uh, World War II. And it asks us, what do we really care about? And in that sense, what Richard is saying uh, is extremely important. What we really care about more than anything is the well-being, the happiness of ourselves, of the people we love, and, the, and uh, of uh, the institutions that we value. So uh, one silver lining of COVID is bringing us closer to uh, what we most humanly value. Thank you both. Uh, we're, we're running out of time, but I, I have a series of lovely questions that have come in uh, relating to different age groups. Uh, first of all, older people and then to the next generation, really. So in terms of uh, older people, we've seen obviously the tragedy of this pandemic um, affecting you know, older age groups much more severely than younger people. Um, so obviously with that in context, there's a couple of questions which are interesting here. First of all, Sue has asked, do you, would you say that positive psychology is as relevant to senior citizens as to children? And Maggie has asked, um, she's referred to the U-shaped curve of happiness in which we see that people are sort of happier over 65 as, as, they, as they were in their youth. And of course, um, rather less happy in midlife. And, and why is that? And again, perhaps both of those things in the context of the current crisis where of course that age group is under, uh, well, their well-being is really at threat. What would be your observations on older age groups, positive psychology and this situation, Marty? Well, uh, good question. Uh, up until COVID, uh, I have been reading and uh, talking about the statistics on aging in which uh, uh, 70 is the new 55 and the like. Uh, the statistics up until COVID had been a uh, marked increase in both lifespan and in physical health. Uh, as we age. COVID uh, is in danger of reversing that. We're in danger here of uh, reversing the, the longer lifespan, the healthier lifespan for older people. Um, that's a reality. We have to think about it. Uh, I should say something about my own case. Um, usually uh, in my life at age 77, I'm always on to the next project, the next book, the future. But I'm also a realist about COVID. So I've been thinking more and more about wrapping it up and legacy and what will I leave. Uh, and this is a form of realistic optimism, I think. Um, as for children, I think this is a terribly formative event for young children. It will be the equivalent of the Great Depression and World War II for people who are just coming into teenage. So the way we think about COVID, what we do as individuals, what these young people do as individuals uh, will be formative for the rest of their lives. So the question of childhood is a very important one now. Uh, Richard works on well-being in children and I'm, I'm really eager to hear uh, his reaction uh, both to the old age question and COVID and to the importance of this awful event for children. Well, it's very interesting. Of course, the, the so-called U-shaped um, pattern of well-being over the life course has disappeared. It, 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 the, the youth is the, is the least happy at the moment, and then middle age and then old age, because youth are being so impacted on by being locked up, by having their career prospects um, taken away from them, by having their friends taken away from them and so on. Um, 
so uh, it's um it's this is really a, a, a huge challenge because the young um are paying the price for protecting the old this is what's happened i mean there was no reason for a lockdown from the point of view of young people at all um it was for the sake of the old and we owe the young a huge huge debt uh, and i personally think that we have to have some sort of a guarantee of employment and training for young people that is absolutely the top priority of public expenditure we don't want lots of physical build 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 uh, as our prime minister in britain has been saying uh, we want to build our, uh, our, our human capital um, and uh, the lives of our young people um, with proper job opportunities uh, i think they've got to we've got to have a, a real program like the new deal um, of franklin Delano roosevelt we've got to have a real real deal uh, for young people guaranteeing employment uh, and training if they are not to be cheated as a result of this uh, this terrible pandemic so gentlemen it's been a wonderful wide-ranging conversation certainly very very topical uh, right now we're, we're, we have a, just a, a couple of minutes left and uh, I'm sorry to all of those whose questions haven't been able to be answered uh, but we'll, we will be sending a follow-up email to all participants tomorrow with access to the video and um, able to follow up any other queries um, I wanted to end by asking you to sort of both share a, a brief closing comment and I wondered if I might frame that around perhaps the central question that Action for Happiness is trying to address. We have, as you, as you know, this course called Exploring What Matters, encouraging people to think about what really does matter in life. We've covered so much here today from helplessness to positivity to the, um, pessimism and optimism, health, uh, age, uh, education, policy. If I was to say to you, what really matters in life? What, what, what really matters? How, how might you frame that and perhaps uh, feel free to leave any other closing comments. So Richard, why don't we start with you and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll let Marty have a final word. Well, I, I, I'll just give a personal comment um, that, um, which I, I was groping towards earlier on. Um, I think the ultimate secret of happiness is to connect with the deepest and best part of yourself um i've been reading this wonderful um life of someone called etty hillesom who was a, a jewish lady in amsterdam in the nazi occupation and that is how she resolved the problem of fear she wasn't going to be afraid she was going to connect with the deepest and best in herself and i think that that is a terrific terrific message for for all of us so there is um, use, your, use any word you like, but there is a God within that you have to find. Um, I've been reading about the bubonic plague. I've been reading 14th century literature. And uh, the most inspiring figure in the 14th century was someone called Julian of Norwich. It was actually a female. Uh, she was a monk. She had to be call herself Julian is actually Juliana. And here's what she said. He said not, thou shalt not be travailed. He said not, thou shalt not be tempestive. He said not, thou shalt not be diseased. He said, thou shalt not be overcome and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. <laughs> Inspiring words to end on. Uh, Richard, Marty, thank you both so much for your time and for everything you've done to contribute to this global movement, Richard, as you call it, the, the world movement, trying to promote happiness and well-being. Uh, and a huge thank you to the thousands of people who've been part of this conversation for all of your helpful comments in the chat, how you've been helping each other, for all your questions. And so sorry we only covered a few of them, but what wonderful questions and, and very insightful answers. So huge gratitude to both of our guest speakers and also to all of you for being part of this amazing community. 
please do stay connected with Action for Happiness. Please take our introductory programs. Please join our program of activities. Please be part of this amazing community trying to practice the altruism we've heard about this evening. This idea that our happiness and the happiness of everybody is so intrinsically connected. And please do keep following the great work of, of Martin Seligman and, and of course, uh, Richard through his work with Action for Happiness and others. Thank you all so much for being here and we look forward to seeing you again very soon.